pleased my next introduction is uh, for a colleague, Dr. John Rabbits, who has spent years in the field of ALS. He is a professor of clinical neurosciences at UCSD. Um, he's just done tremendous work and is known globally for his work in understanding and looking at the clinical aspects of disease. He is working now in chromosome 9 and antisense and working closely as a clinician scientist with the industry to move treatments forward. Uh, Dr. Ravitz um, has been a great partner to the ALS Association. He's been an advisor to me on various um, uh, groups in terms of clinical trial design, in building the clinical fellowship through the American Academy of Neurology, and as a reviewer for our grants program. And it's a real pleasure that he could be here today, a little bit not by coincidence, but he is going to be the opening speaker tomorrow for us at our, our research uh, program, and is really very key in all the programs going on in our association. So thank you for taking the time. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for uh, welcoming me here. Thanks for listening to the great introduction, and um, it's a real pleasure to be part of or to be addressing the Philadelphia chapter. We, you, I'm sure you know you were the model for the country. I was in, for 25 years in Seattle, and, which also is a fabulous chapter, and now I'm in San Diego, and we're heading your way, so we're going to try to match you in uh, organization. Um, so you've been an inspiration for us. And then also, uh, you're the group that's funded my, my, one of my first grants uh, from the ALS Association. And so um, I'm particularly bonded to you for all the support that I've received. And, and actually, that's one of the main things I want to talk about today is the research that I'm doing. Uh, in large part, thanks to you and also. And, and two of the collaborators that I get at, the, at UCSD are Don Cleveland and Clotilde Leger Turin, who um, are, and we, we have what we call the uh, ALS uh, Therapy Center. Um, and uh, so these are two of my cl very closest collaborators. I couldn't do what I was doing uh, without them, and I like to think that I'm contributing a lot to what they're doing. These are basic scientists, and one of the, I think, clear messages uh, in the fight is to put clinicians and people uh, who have access to the human disease with the scientists who are working on the mod various models of disease and to sit together and to share. And one of the things, and in uh, the uh, Cleveland Leger Turin groups, there are about eight to ten full-time postdocs from around the world who are working on various aspects of uh, ALS. Um, and we sit together at least for a couple of hours, oftentimes a couple of times a week, where we go over data, share ideas, uh, and at the same time I have lots of human materials, uh, autopsy materials, spinal cords and brains, and gene expression, and skin fibroblasts, and blood samples, and so on, and to get that to them uh, so, that, uh, so that they have human material, so we're working on the real disease, and at the same time for me to leverage their expertise so that I can do things that uh, I want to do. So it's been a great collaboration, a great partnership, and I really think uh, uh, it's a model for the future of how ALS research really should proceed, is to give, put people together and give, give us time to be thinking and working on these things. Um, and then uh, Lucy had talked earlier about the partnership with the industry, and uh, that's also was, was weird to me at first because we were academics and we were doing research and then we would have frequent meetings with a company up the road at, in Carlsbad um, and there was this open exchange and I had always been taught uh, that you know there's academics and that there's industry uh, and that their worlds are hard and you have very strict rules about exchanging information and here I was sitting where there was just open exchange back and forth of, um, of ideas and information, and test results, and so on. And soon I became, and especially as my work proceeded, I became very comfortable with this kind of arrangement. And, but it's, it's a new paradigm that academics and industry and drug development um, and companies, all having different interests, should work together and work together openly. And I think we're learning the rules, we're writing the rules, there's agreements, and as you can imagine, when the university and the lawyers get involved, it gets complicated, but there are ways to work this out so there really can be a free exchange um, uh, from anybody with expertise that can help. Okay, so this is um, 
I think one of, becoming one of my favorite pictures. And with, with this was his early, um, in the work on, I'm going to tell you, tell you about this new gene, C9 ORF72. And uh, uh, early on, one of the things we needed were samples from patients. And particularly the skin biopsies. It turns out the skin biopsy contains a cell called the fibroblast. You can then culture those cells and they become essentially more. You can grow them and um, proliferate them and uh, then divide them up and keep making them grow. And it becomes a model of the disease. And it becomes a model of the disease because it's carrying the mutation. So it's no longer artificially engineered, but it's the actual real mutation. Uh, and then uh, what we'll hear more about is how those cells can then be manipulated, become stem cells, and do all kinds of exciting things. But just to get the materials was important. And this was a, a family. So this is a patient um, who I actually went up to San Francisco. He, lives, he lived in Berkeley. And I was going up there for a meeting, and I had a call out in, within the state of California uh, that I needed more uh, fibroblast, um, or more skin biopsies for the fibroblast cultures. And I had to be going up, and this family um, was identified, and they would be happy to donate. So I went actually did a house call. So I spent this lovely afternoon um, chatting and exchanging and becoming very bonded to uh, him and his wife. I can't tell you his name. Um, and then, uh, and then FedEx the samples down to San Diego where my team was down there waiting for it and cultured it and so on. And of course, when you go from the human condition to the research condition, everything has to be de-identified. So he became known as C94. Uh, and then about a year later, uh, he was visiting San Diego uh, for a vacation or some event. And uh, so I had the family come and visit the lab and then meet with the scientist who I was working with so that they could see my perspective as a clinician working with patients with the disease look like. So the, these guys are doing cutting edge work on C9 ORF72 um, and uh, but they had never seen a patient with it. So I thought this would be a great chance for them to see what the realities are of the disease and then also for them to get reassurance about what kind of people are, are working quickly to try to uh, get therapy in place. Now if you can see in the back here, uh, so one of the things I wanted to do was to tell the uh, scientists, what it, what's a medical tradition? There's medicine and there's science, and they're really, interestingly, worlds apart. So doctors and scientists are, are completely different traditions, uh, as I'm learning. So one of the things I wanted to do was to teach the scientists the medical tradition. And the medical tradition uh, involves taking, uh, going through the chief complaint, history of the present illness. Chief complaint would be weakness in the legs. The history of the present illness is stumbling a year ago, uh, then getting more weakness up the leg, and so on, the details of the patient's story. And then you do a social history, you want to know something about their background, um, and then of course the genetic history. And so interesting, I think you can see in the background on the white, as I walk through this, I wrote all of these things down to show, share my tradition with the scientists. Well, afterwards when we were all meeting, I discovered that my patients, this is his daughter, and uh, what I learned that she was pregnant. So here you see a genetic disease, which we know to be uh, repeat expansions in the gene C9 or F72. Uh, his daughter, who was now had a 50-50 chance of being a gene carrier. So she, he, she has, like I say, a 50% chance that she inherited the gene from him uh, the good gene or the bad gene from him, and then of course the one from the mother's side. So she had a 50% risk of having the disease, and she was pregnant, uh, and uh, so the child's in utero, um, and that child, depending on what her gene carrier status, would also either be at risk or free of the, the, the disease risk. And so I just thought this is a magnificent story, talking about sort of medicine, science, and genetics, and how it sort of all comes together with the human um, dimension. But then also, I think you can see here, I made hats for them. 
to show you know, that in science we have everything de-identified to protect the privacy of individuals. And so he was the fourth line. But that, that's the face um, of one of our experiments. And they actually recognized themselves in one of the publications that we did. So it's just a neat story to show how complicated uh, the social and political and medical and scientific aspects are, as well as the molecular biology. OK, so I want to talk a little bit um, now about this latest excitement with C9 or 72 And the story probably goes back um, sometime in the early 2000s, when it was known that there was a big signal, meaning that there were families with, uh, there was a region on chromosome 9 uh, that was going to be a big player in ALS, and also in uh, a disease called frontotemporal dementia, which I think you've heard about, but it's a related disease. And uh, in fact, some of the families had in one member dementia and in another member ALS. So there was a lot of thought about how could this be? Is it the same gene or is it connected? And that was identified in 2011. So that was the latest um, big breakthrough in terms of the genetics was identifying this. And it was quickly learned how, how big a player this is. So C9R72, if we say, let's just say ALS is 10% genetic and 90% sporadic out of the blue, it's 40% of the genetic, uh, and it's up to about 6% of the sporadic. So if we take patients who we think were sporadic, but we test them, up to 6% or so may test positive for this gene, which means that the family histories were incomplete, the gene didn't express itself, there's a lot of different explanations. So overall, this accounts for as much as perhaps 8 to 10% of all ALS. So it's the single biggest piece of the pie in terms of uh, ALS um, that we have. Now, uh, I want, one point I want to make is we talk about the genetics. Genetics gets all the attention, and, and I just want to make clear why that is. The reason uh, is because we know what we're dealing with. If we have a gene, we know that that gene is causing a disease, if it's C9 or if it's SOD1. And so we have a fighting chance of trying to understand it. With sporadic disease, where do you begin? Um, there are probably genetic components, there's environmental, there's triggers, there's all those kinds of things. And if we're having a trouble uh, understanding the genetics, it may, you can see how much more complicated it is trying to understand sporadic disease. So but clearly sporadic disease is what we're after. That's the one we want. Um, but we take with what we got and then hopefully things learned in familial disease, we will then be able to apply to sporadic disease. So that's the ex question I get a lot is, why are we focusing on such a small part of it? And that's why, and of course, we all want the uh, sporadic disease. So this is uh, C9 um, or 72. And I just want to show you what a gene looks like. Remember, gene um, is, uh, your, your DNA carries all the genes, right? And the DNA, it turns out the genes only are about two or three percent of the DNA. So there's lots of DNA that's in there that got there for reasons we don't know, evolutionary, all sorts of complicated regions. But the gene is, um, is here. It's a stretch of DNA. It's got little pieces to it, so we have names for those. There's exons and in introns are stretches in between that we don't think, we don't know what they exactly they do. Then this is the part, these little square boxes, is called an exon, and that's the part that codes for the protein. And what was identified is that in this non-coding area, meaning area that doesn't, we don't think becomes protein, there was a huge, what's called an expansion. So remember the DNA is all code, composed of different letters in it. The, the body's job is to decode these sequences. This is a huge expansion that uh, was identified of G, 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 C, C. It goes on and on, G, 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 C, C, etc. for hundreds, maybe thousands of these expansions. Um, and that was the mutation. Um, and one of the reasons it was so difficult to find um, was that it was this character, it wasn't just a single changed letter, it was a whole big stretch 
of letters that we're repeating. Now, it turned out that there's a whole group of diseases, so, that's, so that was the first big discovery. This was a big piece of ALS. The second huge breakthrough on this was that this kind of a mutation, which is called the repeat expansion, um, or expanded repeat, the expansion ex means that it's bigger than normal, and it's a repeat, is this repeat sequence, really was characteristic of a whole group of diseases, 20, 30 diseases that had been worked on and was a, a, a very hot part of science. And so all of a sudden now ALS was able to move into this, to all of what was learned in these different diseases. Some of them were muscular dystrophies, some of them were ataxias, the whole group, most of them all were neurological, Huntington's disease. Um, so this moved ALS, or at least this part of ALS, into this field of science. Um, uh, the third er, was that it connected ALS and front temporal dementia, so that all of a sudden made it that these were really, in some strange way, the same disease. And so we had to try to understand that, but it certainly put, secured the association that was long suspected. Uh, and then um, the fourth, uh, Big discovery is that there were treatments that could be conceivably target that. And so now all of a sudden we had the potential of a therapy whose purpose it was, was to target a sequence. Um, and so, for instance, in sporadic disease, it's nice to say gene therapy and to say molecular mechanisms and all these fancy things, but we don't know really what we're treating. In this case, we know what we're treating. We're tre we know that that's doing it somehow. Uh, and we had a bullet, a smart bullet, that we think is able to target on that. So what I want to just tell you about next is a little bit about those magic bullets. I think I'll skip that and just go to the magic bullets. So this is um, a therapy called antisense oligonucleotides. Let me just back up a second to this. Here, remember this is sequence, so that's called um, sense. So anything that is the opposite of that is called antisense. So the whole term antisense oligonucleotide therapy comes from the idea that you're going to take what you're, you dial in or program what it is you're trying to, um, to target. You dial in the opposite, the antisense and then that will be able to find it, basically recognize it, and conceivably take it out. So that's where the name antisense oligonucleotide. And oligonucleotide means a short, a nucleotide is just any one letter. An oligonucleotide would be multiple but not huge. So in this case, about 18. So there's about 18 letters. That will be the oligonucleotide, and it's in the antisense direction, so it's going to go opposite to what it is you're trying to recognize. And then this is the way they work. So the, this is the, um, the oligonucleotide, the antisense oligonucleotide. It's applied, in the case of ALS, what the thinking is, is that you'll we'll introduce it through a spinal tap. It's, by the way, this, this has had about two decades of modifications and work from the firm, from the company ISIS to modify the, the chemistry of this so that in fact it becomes a drug. So it's not just taking sequence, there's all kinds of years and years of work modifying it so that it's stable, so that it, it doesn't induce an immune response, it's not rejected, uh, it's chemically stable, it penetrates into the tissues, all these things that you need to have with a drug. So it's been, it's been a modified molecule, but now it's ready to go, it's actually already going into humans, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But anyway, so if you take the sequence, um, it goes through the cell, so it goes into, you put it in the spinal tap, it diffuses through the, the spinal axis, the spinal cord of the brain, penetrates through the cells, and finds its way into the nucleus. And there, in the nucleus, then, it will recognize, because of its programmed sequence, it will recognize what, what it is you want to take out, in this case the expansion. Um, and then because of that, that interaction and some other parts of this, it draws in an enzyme or a protein that sits inside the nucleus whose job it is 
to take away that kind of combination of chemistry. So it's so it recognizes what you want to take out. It draws the <coughs> attention of this enzyme called an RNASH, whose job is to break that up. It breaks it up, but it leaves the, the bullet alone. So in a way, it's more than a magic bullet, because a magic bullet explodes when it's done. This magic bullet, once it's taken out its target, finds the next target, so it sits there. Uh, and then every time it sees one of those, it will draw the attention of this, and this gets repeated over and over. And it's thought that once these are find their way into the cell, that it will last potentially two, three months, maybe six months. So the duration of effect is quite long, unlike most drugs, which is what, three hours, four hours, six hours, um, or a single day. Here we have a drug that we think will be stable for months, um, maybe many months. So those are some of the issues that are being reckoned with as we go into clinical trial. But you can see how exquisite the mechanism is. Um, and notice that, that the sequence that's in here can be modified. You can put in any sequence you want so that the recognition of its target can vary. Um, and so, so it can be a program to go against SOD1. Could, if we knew it to program it for, for sporadic ALS, we could potentially do it for sporadic ALS. We're going to do it for C9. There's specific, um, if you know what you want to target, you could probably make the chemistry and target it. It's just that we don't, in many of the ALS cases, we, we don't know what it is that we should be targeting. And so that's a big part of the research right now. But that's why I think everybody's so excited about antisensitic nucleotides is its exquisiteness of action. It's had 20 years of development. Um, there are now a number of uh, different, and it's already been tested in SOD1, so let's just talk a little bit about that. So it's gone into clinical trial, um, boy, I think two years ago. It performed very well, and by performed very well, I mean it was well-tolerated, side effects, the feasibility of doing this in patients um, I think exceeded expectations. And then in the meantime, in that period of time, the chemistry got even more sophisticated and more refined, and so the company made a decision they weren't going to proceed with that molecule because they had even better ones. And so they had to start over, but they're starting over now with the uh, optimism um, of, uh, that this will be well tolerated, and then now trying to decide whether it helps. And, um, and it's going into other diseases. So at the same time that ALS is becoming a big area testing ground for this, it's being tested right now for spinal muscular atrophy, which is a somewhat similar motor neuron disease. Uh, and it's going to be tested for myotonic muscular dystrophy, which is a very common form of muscular dystrophy, and for uh, Huntington's disease, which is a kind of a late onset dementia and movement disorder. So it's got multiple applications. I personally think ALS is going to be the, the prime testing ground for, for all of it, because in ALS, we, we've been doing clinical trials now for 20 years. As difficult and as problematic as our methodologies are, they are very refined. We have lots of experiments, or lots of experience testing drugs in patients. Uh, and these other diseases are, are more complicated in that regard. So I think ALS, we're all, I think the world is watching ALS right now on how these perform because this is going to be the, what's called proof of principle. This is the proof that this kind of approach uh, is, uh, could work. So it's, that's keeping a lot, of, a lot of us very excited and very busy. But it's going to be a process. I mean, this is going to be, we're talking um, over five years of work ahead of us. Uh, to get this going. So I think I'm going to stop there. That was a lot of chemistry and a lot of strategy, but I hope uh, I tried to strip it down and make it, make it so you could understand.